so um, I wanted to know, you mu- for me, I feel like the challenge of directing this is Childhood's End was written, and it has this epic open where all the ships come, and then after that, there have been so many movies and TV series that have essentially adapted that scene from Childhood's End, from uh, the V miniseries to Independence Day. Um, did you did you feel like when the aliens first came that you wanted to change it because these other movies have done something similar to that, or...? A lot's been written about how much has been inspired by Arthur C. Clarke's Childhood's End, and the themes the themes of the novel are have been interpreted. Matt's taken that into the screenplay. Yeah, I I, I hoped there was a different take on when ships arrive and hang over the city. And um, I was on a train, short story, I was on a train going to one of our pre-production meetings. I stopped at station, I looked across at the other platform, which was packed with people, and every single person was looking at their iPhone. And I thought, wow, what would happen now? Everyone would look down. They wouldn't look up. They'd look down. Everything's about social media now. In, in um, it's a big change. He kind of predicted that. If there's some famous interviews with Arthur C. Clarke, I, I don't know whether you've seen of, of in Iran. I think it's the early 70s where a computer's about the size of this room, and the interviewer has got his little son there, and he's saying, "So you're telling me that by the time he's my age, everybody's going to have one of these in their house?" And Arthur C. Clarke goes, "No, well, it won't be like this. It'll be like a book." You, you can speak to it and it will talk back to you and it, you'll be able to buy your theatre tickets. You're um, extraordinary. Um, great predictions. Um, amazing anxieties of when I read the, the broad stroke pitch of when a, war, a human race has discovered the ability to travel beyond our galaxy to other planets. Maybe there's another life force out there that comes and goes, oh, hang on a minute, you can stay where you are, um, but have a, have a wonderful golden age. I thought, how pertinent to now? Uh, we're in as much anxiety now in our world as we were, if not more, than, than when this was written in 1953. Um, but to come back to your initial question, yeah, I think um, uh, a lot has been inspired by it. I hope we've embraced um, a fresh tone. So you were a fan of the book? I'm a big fan of Arthur C. Clarke. To be honest, I didn't know the book uh, until I was made aware about the project and then was fascinated by it. I knew 2001, of course, um, what huge shoes to be filling to for any production team to go into not only Arthur C. Clarke but Stanley Kubrick and 2001 to be uh, following, trying to follow any of that is a big undertaking. and. A lot of my task is in encouraging everybody on the production team and the cast and that to not be intimidated by that, to be as bold and and uh, fresh with their thought as possible. So now I ask me this too then. So what then do you think the story offers for someone who hasn't read the book and has gone straight into the minutes? I think it's not important that you you've read the book. I think with any um, in some respects, if you've read any novel, when, when you then see it on the screen, nobody looks quite like you thought they were going to look. Um, there's always an interpretation on it, so it is within itself the most extraordinary story of human nature, of the effect of something on how humans re- interact with each other. To me, more than more than science fiction, if you like, the human story and how they deal with the control and what's offered to them is really interesting. So I know you can't give too much away, but can you talk a little bit about adapting the overlords for screen? 
In what respect? Oh. Um, like, they, they have this really magnificent look that's in the book. Um, did you guys want to sort of keep it pretty much the same as the book, or did you want to do some flourishes to kind of modernize it a little bit? Um, impossible to say without being terrible, terrible to spoilers. Um, you know, I think Matthew d- did a fantastic job in interpreting what was in the book. Um, can I ask, now, you, you've directed a lot of Doctor Who episodes. Yes. Um, what are, um, what's the difference between... Daisy Betts? Oh, Daisy Betts. Hi. Come and join us. Hi, everybody. Hey. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Oh. So, Daisy. I was hoping I would get to sit next to Nick sometime That's today. really good to do, to do a twosome. Yes. A <laughs> twosome. Okay. Uh, I just wanted, I just wanted to talk real quick about. Um, could you talk a little bit about the differences between directing Doctor Who um, and and this, which is slightly more hard science fiction? Absolutely. And Daisy Betts wasn't in Doctor Who, which was a big disappointment to me. Thank you. The same. Um, any any interpretation of a story is about. Does it make you laugh? Does it make you cry? Does it make you frightened? Um, the job as filmmakers is to to take an audience on a ride and be with those people, want to be with those people or not want to be with those people. Um, So whether it's Doctor Who or Sherlock or Charter's End, um, the the process of of dramatising or filmmaking employs the same wonderful skills of people like Daisy. People like Nick Horan. You find an, uh, a character um, in casting that takes what's been put on the page by the screenwriter and then puts their own character to within that that person. Can you tell us about your character? And... Yes, I, I played Ellie Ryberg, who who was the girlfriend and then wife of Ricky Stormgren, the main character of the the show. Um, and Ricky is the chosen one who gets to liaise between the overlords and um, you know humans on Earth. And so Ellie is kind of, I feel like she's the, correct me if I'm wrong, because I often, prov- I, I needed guidance from Nick. It's a very complicated story. And it I had to trust, I had to trust what he was doing a lot because I was like, hang on a second, what? Um, the Ellie is, is kind of like the rock that grounds Ricky to, to Earth. And he has things that pull him to the aliens, um, to the overlords, to the spaceship. So he's got this like struggle between where he wants to be. And Ellie is what provides you know that want to come home and be living on planet Earth and, and taking care of planet Earth. And she's also the, the question of um, the voice of reason in a way, uh, not to jump in bed with the overlords so quickly to question how much good it's actually brought to their relationship and not in a selfish way but you know it's utopia but it kind of destroyed their lives together which was really sweet and we we set up really nicely Mm -hmm. at the beginning of the show their kind of relationship and their fun um love story and then how when we when we find them 15 years later that's kind of strained and a little bit um destroyed by the celebrity that Ricky has as a as the liaison and, and the pilgrims at the gate and um, and just what they they can no longer have and their privacy in there and then in their world but you know it feels selfish to kind of talk about that because the overlords have provided this utopia so we should be happy right that's that's the conundrum absolutely right and and uh, Ellie's relationship with Ricky is an indication of how whatever the event that happens it's the effect it has on a really solid relationship and a lovely relationship it's the effect it has on them that's the drama that's the 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 story um, that we follow through a a chosen one to be a conduit between somebody who's and un- doesn't want to be a hero they really don't and that's why they're chosen they don't want to be that person 
they're good at it, but they don't really want to do it, and the effect it has on a very strong relationship. Yeah, and Ellie's not, um, you know, she's not uh, resentful that Ricky was chosen. She's not surprised. I mean, she loves him, and she knows, of course, my husband is going to be the one who is chosen. I mean, he's he's amazing. He's approachable. He's he's humble. And he's just like this beautiful character inside and out. So she loves him and she's not surprised that everybody else loves him. But, you know, she just wants their old life back. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really interesting thing to want your old life back when you've been handed Utopia. And, and she has a great line which says, you know, we had Utopia before they came, which I think is important. And, and that's a question that viewers might think. They're like, okay, what, what in my life is good? And I want to focus on that and keep that. That's, how, that's what I like about it. Ellie's character and the show. You know, I thought one of the really interesting things about the book is when um, when the overlords come and they give Utopia, some of the stuff that we lose are things like art that's sort of been destroyed. Uh, do you guys touch upon stuff like that in the? Uh, I think very much. I think the, the in, in the book it says the the only enemy of Utopia is boredom, um, and I think that loss of culture, loss of individuality, loss of. Uh, the ability to express yourself is absolutely what is this a golden age is this a utopia given everything be careful what you wish for you're given everything you want you're healthy suddenly everybody's healthier they live longer they look great they, it's a bit like we Los Angeles really you know, it's sort of, um, <laughs> we definitely touch on that that subject we're not allowed to talk about it too we're not much. allowed to talk about <laughs> but, it but that is I that is no more. that is in our TV adaption of the book so yeah, you can look forward to that. It's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool little element of it as well. And why was it filmed in Australia? What did that kind of Because it's a new world. It's a very fresh um, landscape. Careful what you say, because I'm Australian. She's Australian. <laughs> and so is Julian really and Yael. Careful. Um... um it was one of the options and seeing the locations and the look of it, it had a number of, of uh, opportunities we really wanted to embrace for it. It's a fantastic country. It's a beautiful city. Yeah. Are you from Melbourne? No. Melbourne's not the best at what you're <laughs> I'm from Sydney, but I love Melbourne too. That was that was my chance um, to live there for the first time. I, I felt like it's not Australia is not hard to make look like utopia. I mean, there are so many landscapes, vast landscapes, that you go, wow, that's a beautiful country. And so I thought that's a good Lots choice. Lots of spiders and snakes and things and sharks. Yeah. And well, yeah. It's a beautiful country. Yes. It's, uh, Where are you from? New Zealand? Yeah, I could I could hear an accent there. But New Zealand could have been another option, but it's not as warm. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's beautiful there yeah, too. We're very lucky. A lot of our crew are from New Zealand and, uh, because The Hobbit had finished filming, and uh, so we had a lot of... Um, yeah. Can I ask, I don't know if I'll be able to talk to you again, so I want to ask um, Day of the Doctor, you shot Brilliant, brilliant. Can you Thank talk a little you. bit about that scene with Matt Smith and Tom Baker and why we like shooting that? In what re- in what respect? Um, like, what were these sort of emotions on set having uh, this other iconic... I mean, the whole process was quite extraordinary, I have to say. Uh, uh, he's a legend. Tom Baker is a legend. He turned up very early on the set. <laughs> so I shouldn't be talking about Doctor Who. Um, no, you've obviously got a huge fan right here. You've got he to answer the question. He was just extraordinary. Everybody... In, I've never seen as many crew queue up for autographs as having Tom Baker on set. He was pretty awesome. Again, he has that voice. He has that. You've got the grooming for a good reason here. Come Um, on.